I got to Vietnam in November of 1968. I left on my birthday, which is November 10th. Uh, everybody said we had a nice party. Everybody said goodbye. We drove out to the airport. I flew to California and I reported at the uh, reception center out there on November 11th, which was Veterans Day. Mm -hmm. And then a couple of days later, I ended up in Benoit, Vietnam. So you flew into Benoit. Were you on yeah. one of these commercial flights? Yeah, yeah, one of the big commercials. Do you have any recollection of the flight? I'm, I'm always interested, you know, you get on the flight, you're still in the States, uh, many hours later, you're landing in Benoit. Do you have any recollection of sort of a transition in your own disposition, in your own mind, as you're getting closer and closer to Vietnam, as you actually touch down in Vietnam? You know, I was, you know, I have to say, I was, you know, pretty kind of gung-ho. So on the plane, I was looking forward to getting there, you know, getting this thing going. And um, it was a long flight, you know, we slept, they fed us. It, 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 it was boring too. You know, there was just this big anticipa anticipation until we landed. And then that was a whole different thing. They opened up that door and you felt that heat just rush at you. Mm -hmm. There were all these guys lined up, cheering and clapping. And it was dark. We got in there at nighttime. And these guys and they couldn't understand why these guys were all cheering and clapping. Mm -hmm. And again, the heat had just hit us as it was my turn as I got off the plane. And they started handing us, they gave me some money. And I thought, oh, geez, look at all this money he's giving to me. Little did I know it was like pennies and nickels. It was the Vietnamese money, but they were they were leaving and they were happy to see us because they were getting on that plane and they were leaving and we were coming in. We could hear off in the distance, you could hear uh, probably howitzers shooting boom, 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 nowhere near us, you know, but it was like, wow, this is it, you know, there. But it was a very cold place. They just had a bunk, uh, you know, bunks in a mattress up there and you threw your your uh, duffel bag up and just kind of sat around until they gave you orders to leave. So yeah, that night was kind of a uh, exhausting. So I think I slept a lot of it. So even that the your first hour or so in Vietnam, you're hearing howitzers in the background. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. It was off in the distance. So this I don't. Is, this is for yeah. Me. Yeah, exactly. You get that feeling. It's like wow. This, but again. You know, I wanted to get to my unit. I wanted to see where I was going to be. This was all transition. And it, it just, it's, it's, it's nerve wracking sitting around doing nothing. In the morning, they then gave me, my name got called and it was time for me to leave Benoit and head to Tonsonu to get a flight back. But that was the first time we pulled out of Benoit and I looked out, I saw some water buffaloes and Papa San behind them. And I'll never forget these thoughts. I've had it ever since. I said to myself, this is my destiny. So destiny in the longer run of your life in that you um, spend your career working with veterans. Um, but what did it mean to you at the moment? You had that thought, this is my destiny. Of course, you don't know what you're going to be doing 30, 40 years yeah. down the road. What, what did it mean to you at that time? At that moment, it was like I felt like I was going to be fulfilling something about myself. And it was a very strange thing to say to myself, but that's what I did say to myself when I saw it all. I, it just said, I have no idea. It just it, what what it was, those thoughts were, this is my destiny, that I was to engage myself into whatever was going to be there, I suppose, in some ways. But hmm. I just felt like this was where I was supposed to be. Talking about the plane opens and you get hit with the heat and then you head south where I think sometimes the humidity is so thick you could almost feel like you're drowning down there uh, yeah. in, the, in the Delta. Um, so you go to Vin Long, uh, so what was your job? Uh, I was on a 106 Jeep. Uh, that is a recordless rifle. That's where I'd been trained down to Fort Poe. So it was a four-man Jeep, um, driver, one that commanded the Jeep, a, a loader and a gunner. And uh, I had, I would drove for a while, then I ended up being a gunner on the 106. And uh, it had three different rounds on it. Uh, one was an armor piercing round, which we rarely used. We had maybe one or two of those, but we had a high explosive round and a flechette round. Mm -hmm. Now the flechette round, we could adjust the nose of it from, uh, I don't remember from say 50 yards to about a thousand yards out. And when it would explode, there'd be 10,000 steel darts flying right through the air. 
So we use that uh, on a number of occasions and the high explosive rounds also. So what kind of missions are you doing where you're using flechette rounds uh, fired from a Jeep down in the day? Yeah, well, well uh, some of our mission was, uh, the easy part was we pulled convoys. We protected convoys. We always traveled from Bin Long to Canto. I drove a, a, all over in the Mekong Delta, as far north, north of Saigon, up to a city called, a uh, town called Xi'an. Mm -hmm. And Saigon, uh, then down in the Mekong Delta, down to Canto, down to uh, Chi Lang. We had our jeeps out there, um, but we pulled convoys to protect them. That was part of our job. Part of our our job was to protect the base camp at Vin Long. We had special positions for the 106 jeeps uh, for nighttime guard. But we left Vin Long often and for long periods of time. We headed out to the field, and we were around the mountains around Chi Lang, Triton. Um, this, this was the southern part of the Ho Chi Minh Trail, mm -hmm. just before it emptied into Rock Jaw and then down to Kamau, which was the human forest. We never messed with the human forest, not when I was in deep troop. Later on, I ended up playing games down there. They got serious. But when I was on 106 Jeep, pretty much we supported um, Cambodian soldiers. We supported uh, Green Berets. They would go up these mountains and sweep the mountains, and we'd be at the base of the mountain on the road, and we'd shoot up to the uh, mountains. Uh, wow. They would pick a smoke grenade. So we would know that like, a red smoke grenade would go in. they go, what color? It's red. All right, we know where you are. They'd shoot some tracers at an area we wanted to, they wanted us to fire at, and we could direct fire um, right into that spot and hit them with a, a high explosive round and blow them up. And, uh, and that's what we basically did. You're supporting Cambodian troops who are in Vietnam, or they're on the other side of the border in Cambodia? No, they're in Vietnam. They were mercenaries. They were being paid by the Green Berets, had a lot of Cambodian mercenaries. Um, we call them Mike Forces. So wow. we supported them. Uh, I don't think I ever supported Arvins, although I, uh, yes, maybe I did a couple of times, I recall. But they would line up on a road and they'd start walking across an open rice paddy up to the base of the mountains there. And then they would go up the mountain. And in the meantime, we sat back there. We'd get shot at, sniped at, uh, rounds go at us. Wow. Uh, and then would, again, we would fire back up. And then the problem we had is we were always vulnerable at night. So we'd get hit with mortar attacks, uh, a lot of different areas where we were at. You mean because you're of the Jeep, especially? I mean, they're, you're not, yeah, it's, not, no, it's not yeah. an armored person. Yeah, it's just an open Jeep. And we had other Jeeps. We had, uh, each platoon had, we had three platoons. Each platoon had two 106s. They had uh, a couple 50 caliber Jeeps and then uh, some 60 caliber Jeeps and a mortar platoon within that, that, that platoon, uh, a mortar squad. And uh, so we didn't really have any protection. We couldn't dig in in the delta because you would hit water right away. There was only so far you could go into the ground and dig a foxhole. Wow. So we were pretty much along the base, uh, uh, the base of these mountains. I lost a friend. Um, Bowen died, Dwayne Bowen, on uh, May, I believe it's the 30th. It was a day or so before his 21st birthday. Mm -hmm. And that had happened to us at the base of the mountains. We were nighttime. They fired rocket-propelled uh, grenades at us and uh, hit a tree above him, took off half of his head, hit another guy by the name of Chalquette, hit him in the throat, he survived. But, you know, we fired back jet rounds into the dark, but didn't know where they were, that was it. How long had you been in Vietnam before you experienced your first combat? Um, well, let's back up. I was in Vietnam about seven days. I uh, finally got down to base camp and um, pretty much all, uh, everybody in the in my troop had gone to the field. There were only a few guys back there at the time to guard perimeter. And I was green. Um, we did sandbagging for a bunker every day, myself and three different other guys. And uh, mm -hmm. they were Puerto Rican guys. And we got along. I, you know, I was didn't know these people from Puerto Rico. You know, I was fresh from Detroit, Michigan, I didn't know anything, but it was nice. We had a good time. Mm -hmm. And we built sandbags in the heat and we got breaks. Sunday came along 
And the sergeants told us, he said, look, he said, you can have the afternoon off, but you know, don't go downtown. I said, okay. So as the afternoon came along, the four of us started walking towards the service club way at the other end of the base. I thought, you know, let's go down there and see what's going on. So we got to the uh, road going out to the, uh, out of the base camp. And the one guy go, I go, where are you going? He goes, oh, we're going downtown. I said, no, I said, you know, Jasper told us not to go. He said, oh, come on, we're going to go anyway. That fat ass, what does he know? I said, no, I'm going to stay here. So I went down to the service club. A few hours later, I'm back at the uh, hooch and Jasper came in. He goes, he said, do you know Ortiz? And I go, yeah. He goes, come on with me. He was really angry. And I go, what? what's wrong? And he goes, you got to identify his body. And I kind of like freaked out. I go, what? He goes, yeah, get in the truck. I go, what happened? He goes, he got killed downtown. And, you know, I was green. I go, would, would he get hit by a truck? He goes, no, he got blown up in a bar. Get in the goddamn truck. And he just yelled and screamed at me all the way down to the dispensary. So they took me in the dispensary and unzipped the bag. And there he was in pieces and uh, zipped it back up. Jasper grabbed the back of my head, took me about maybe about two feet from him and shake him. He said, look at him, look at him. You don't do what you're told in Vietnam. This is going to happen to you. And he throws me up against the wall. And I'm shaking about ready to pass out and puke. You know, I'm, I'm, this has just done me a number. Mm-hmm. So um, we left there. And then that night we got mortared. So about seven days into Vietnam is when I really got a bite of this is not a game at all. Seven days in, he was, I saw him get killed. Or not get killed, but saw him. And then my last seven days in Vietnam, I'm out at the flight line. And some guy walks into the tail rotor of a helicopter and it knocks his head all over the place, splattered everywhere. And it was like, okay, here's a going home gift, Joe. Take a look at another one. But in between, there was there was plenty to deal with. So this incident you described um, about Ortiz, obviously that's gonna shake you up in the moment. Um, does that, I mean, how does, how does that impact you? Um, you know, sometimes vets talk about a process where they become numb. In other cases, they talk about a process where they just want to get revenge. Um, what what impact did that with, have? With Ortez, I believe pretty much I pretty much got numb. It was really so shocking to me and what I'd gone through. I just kind of shut off from it. I didn't get my revenge until Bowen got killed. That's when I wanted revenge. And that was intense. That's when I ended up transferring out of D troop and went to A troop to fly helicopters. But with Ortiz, I'm pretty sure I was pretty numb. It was so shocking to me that I'd just been there all of a sudden, wham. And I didn't, they kept me in base camp again for about another three or four weeks before the troop came back. And then everything was just pretty crazy then, seeing all these guys and what was going on. How long had you? Um been down in the Delta when Bowen was killed? Bowen was killed in May. I'd been there since November. And it sounds like you were just indicating that when he was killed, that affected you in such a way that you began, I'm interpreting now, you began to think, okay, what can I do to to do even more to take it to the enemy? to exact revenge for Bowen, is, is my interpretation right? Yeah, 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 I had, and I had, uh, after we got hit out, it was called, an area called Treton, when Bowen got killed and Chuck Keck got wounded. It was a few days later, they pulled us back into base camp. We were pretty shook up from it. And uh, he was a first, and Bowen was, um, he had leadership qualities. I mean, he was a leader. I mean, that's it, there were some that were, I have that myself, another friend of mine, Cromer, he has that himself, a few others, uh, a, a friend, Doc O'Leary, you know, some, some people have that, and Bowen was like that, so there were guys that, that listened to him, and he was able to take command and do things, he was a good guy, you know, had his problems that we didn't always like and get along, but mm-hmm. uh, basically, I mean, that that's where he was at, so when Bowen died, it was a big piece of the troop left, it was like, oh my God, you know, of the platoon, Bowen, Bowen went down. So when we got back to base camp, I knew this sergeant in A troop uh, by the name of Ray. And um, he would always talk to me 
make jokes with me. I was Italian, call me Guinea and WAP and stuff. He go, hey, Guinea, you know, when are you going to come over here and fly with us? You know, and I'm like, ah, you know, one day, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to. But when I got back, I ran into him and he started telling me about the stories about uh, guys in A-Troop. They were getting a lot of kills. And it was like, oh, man, it was he was setting a hook. It was there. And uh, then eventually I got a, uh, went down the flight line. He invited me out there and uh, a pilot took me up for a ride. And um, that's when I got hooked and wanted to fly. But prior to that, I kept thinking about it. It's like, man, we're getting, I was, get, we were getting mortared. We got mortared, I don't know, everywhere. Makwa, Chilang, Triton, Bin Long, um, uh, Baswa, mm -hmm. everywhere we were going, we we're getting hit at night, but we weren't getting able to get any good kills back. We had been at Baswa and because um, anything we were shooting with the 106s, we weren't getting any bodies. You know, they were finding a lot of blood, but they weren't finding like, hey, man, there are pieces and stuff here. But, you know, you hit them with these big rounds, you're blowing pieces, people up in pieces. But at Makwa, or rather at Baswa, we had, there was a little bit of a ground attack. They hit us one night and uh, there was this big, huge cement bunker in the 106. We had lifted it on top of there. I got down into the bunker and I was on a machine gun, a 30 caliber. And I kept shooting at this area that was an entrance, a, a road. Just kept laying fired, and I fired, geez, I don't know, a thousand rounds, probably easy thousand rounds. Maybe, no, maybe about a thousand would have been about about ten belts of ammo. Thing was red hot. And uh, later on, I found out that we found out there were a couple of dead ones down there. Did I get them? I don't know. Everybody was shooting. I'd like to thought that you know I was like, yeah, did I get them? You know, but I wanted that kill. I wasn't getting the kill that I wanted. I wanted that anger. But when I got killed. Uh, uh, after this, a little bit after that, and, and it just, it all was starting to come together for me to change. Mm. I was angry. It was getting, the anger was starting to happen. I was starting to hate Vietnam, starting to hate the people, starting to hate everything around me about it, disgusted with everything, the smells, uh, the whole attitude of everybody. And that, that's when it started to change, I'm sure. Wow. So you make the the switch to flying in the in the observation helicopters was part of that as well um i think you've stated very clearly what you know your primary motivation was but was part of that as well the adrenaline of being up in that in that helo and the you know just being yeah, well, you're, you're in a helo but you're five sometimes five feet off the ground and yeah really close well, up with the enemy and that's thing wait, well when the pilot took me out for that pre-flight we got up in the air and he let me fly it for a minute my heart was racing. It was like, oh my God, this is cool. I'm flying this thing, you know? And we went back and then I found out that you learn to fly the, fly the helicopter. It was like, you know, I'm a spec four. Really? This is cool. That's like, wow, this is gung-ho. I'm a 19 year old kid. You're going to teach me to fly this helicopter. Come on, let's go. You know, this yeah. is it. And I, this is, that is unbelievable. I want this. When I first got to the A Troop Platoon Scouts and not everybody talked to me. Uh, even though I came from D Troop, there was another guy that was in there from D Troop, but these guys had been weathered in combat and they knew what the hell I was walking into. And they knew I was stupid with what was coming out of my mouth because I had not been into what they had done already. One of the guys took me downstairs, his room, he was a sergeant, opened up his footlocker and he had this huge Bowie knife, big, huge Bowie knife. And he also showed me, and this, I, I've heard stories, but I know this for sure for what I've seen. He showed me a couple scalps that he had. And I'm like, whoa, this right then and there. And I got the biggest heart on in the world. I think this is great, man. I'm going to be able to take a scalp, bring that home. This would be the coolest thing in the whole wide world. I've seen him since Vietnam, and he did have those scalps home. Um but again, that was this whole thing that was going on in scouts. I mean, I'm like, wow, this is this is cool. Get a couple of scalps, man, you know, get some kills. You know, I'm gung ho as shit, you know. But the rest of these guys uh, in the in the Bay Area where we where we slept and stuff, you know, they knew it, it was stupid. It didn't matter that I had been in combat to them. This was a whole different way of combat. That's for damn sure. You know, I didn't find that out for maybe about a week before I, I went out for my first flight. And was that, did you learn something significant on that first flight? Yeah, that I could puke for a whole day long. 
I threw up the whole time. When the one helicopter goes, the other one goes around in a circle, but we were the wing ship. Well, the helicopter then starts to go on an angle and the whole horizon changes. And I was, my nickname became Vertigo, which is close to my name, Fernango. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, so, and I got Vertigo. I was throwing up. I just started puking everywhere, all over my cell, just constantly puking. Uh, I ended up having to fire my weapon and I shot a hole in the skid. Uh, the only good thing out of that day is because I was so hanging out, so sick, I happened to spot some um, ammo uh, uh, weapons hanging in trees and boxes. And I told the pilot, thing, I see something over and you're like, you're sick, man. He later on, I found out from him, he, he had almost thought about, you know, getting me out of there. He, ne he didn't want to fly with me anymore. It was, oh, a couple months later, I ended up flying with him again. But that, that pretty much, he had a reputation of making you sick, that's for sure. But there were everybody. You got air sickness. That was real bad. And after that happened, uh, we got back to base camp. And uh, there wasn't much action. They had had some, but me, I was just so sick. I didn't care what was going on. Here I'm in the middle of combat. Guys are shooting. And I'm sicker than a dog puking. And any thought I have, as soon as I would look one way, I'd just dry heaving. I couldn't. And then we'd sit down to take a break. And I was you know, uh, moving around, motion sickness. So when I got back to base camp, I could just feel my body moving every which way. I'm like, oh, God. So the guys in Scouts, it was like, so I had gotten the initiation. So the guys that weren't talking to me started talking to me a little bit. You know, and they said, oh, man, you're Ralphed all over yourself. Yeah, I did. Was, was that... Did the pilot do that intentionally as an initiation, or was it just... No, no that out? just happened. They, okay. they did warn me of it, but Sewell knew I was going to end up puking. That's for darn sure. Uh, pretty much every guy that first flew, they, that, that's what happened. Yeah. The unfortunate thing is I borrowed the guy's helmet and gloves. And I puked all over his gloves and over the mouthpiece of his helmet. When I got back, I didn't just drop the stuff where it was. I woke up in the morning at a 38 in my face. He was pissed. He goes, man, you puked all over my stuff. You give me a new helmet, new gloves. And he said, I'll come back or I'll kill you. Yeah. And he was a little guy. And I'm like, you got it. You know, I'm like, but I was, I was sick. It wasn't until uh, the next time I flew, uh, a pilot told me, he said, you should get air sickness pills. I'm like, what? <laughs> Where do they have those at? He's down at the dispensary. I mean, I literally ran down there, got myself a bottle. Of, and that took care of the air sickness. Yeah. What basically was the mission of the light observation helicopter in the Delta? Well, it, about the time I got there, the 9th Division had been on the Mekong River along where Bin Long was. It was down a ways. But they had been pulled out because Nixon pulled them out. And the other base down in Sok Train, uh, it had a lot of military people down there. They pulled them out of there, too. So the 7th and 1st Cav, when I got there and flying scouts, we had everything in the Mekong Delta, pretty much south of Saigon on down. So we would go on different missions wherever... Um, they would get notifications about maybe some VC movements here or VC movement there. And then our day would to fly out to that area and do a search, as we call them, hunter killer teams and do a search and destroy. Find the enemy, try to engage with them and, and kill them is what we did. But it was all over the Delta, all over the mountains. And that was an advantage for uh, pilots that I flew with because I knew the area on the ground. I knew where we were at, um, the mountain areas and the roads. Sometimes we used the roads to get where we were going. And so I knew I knew which direction to go. And it always you, helped. You've been around on the Jeep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So is this the situation where you're the scout and so often very low to the ground looking? You mentioned you find weapons hanging from a tree. I'm sure we're going to hear other things that you observed and saw and engaged from the helo. And then you've got the um, the other helo, um, which escapes me right now, the, the, the name of it, but you've got a, a fighter helo, a Cobra, right? So you've got a yeah. Cobra. So you've got, you know, so you're, he's you're up about, four. yeah, he's up about 400 feet above us. So you've got a Cobra. So then what I've heard then is that if you see something, you may engage, also drop smoke, then the Cobra knows what to hit. Is that is that basically how that goes? Yeah. Yeah, we would fly around about three feet above the ground trying to draw fire. 
I had my chest protector. I painted a bullseye on it. Thought it would be cool. I couldn't get the good red and white, but I had the red circles on it. Um, I, again, this was this thing that we had going on within Scouts. We all had our different weird reputations. Mm -hmm. But we get down at uh, treetop level, a little bit lower across the top. We, we, we try to find any kind of clues of the enemy. Sand pans sitting around, weeds knocked down. You follow a trail. If all the weeds went down in one direction, we would go through that direction. And then, uh, well, I remember, here's a specific, uh, there was a dog and the pilot said to me, he says, shoot at that dog. I go, I don't want to kill that dog. He says, don't kill it. He says, just shoot at it and scare it. Let's see where it runs to, you know? So shot some around because there was nobody around. Sure enough, the dog takes off down a rice paddy dike, cuts around another rice paddy dike, goes into a clump of little bit of trees and a little clump of dirt and stuff right into the hole. There they were. So then we flew over there. And uh, I dropped a, uh, uh, a couple of frags down and then, well, one down there and blew it up a little bit. I remember feeling really lousy that I might have killed the dog, mm -hmm. but I felt kind of good afterwards because I saw the dog run away. In the meantime, then I laid a smoke grenade on top of it. We got out of the area and the Cobras dove at it and blew it up more with rockets to see if anybody else was in there. So a couple of questions. You dropped some frags. So the... Your your helo then gets really low to the ground, and then from the helo you drop them, or do you jump out of the helo? Yeah, right out the door. Yeah, out my left. So left. that's how low you are. That's amazing. Oh yeah, yeah. You want and to then, just pitch it? I'm sorry. Yeah, you're just going to try to pitch it in the spider hole or bunker hole, whatever's there. Mm. Yeah, you get pretty good. And I was right-handed, but you get good left-handed. And we would wrap uh, C4 around the grenade. And pull the pin so we had this we call them super bombs so we had like a pound of c4 around it we throw that drop that whole thing down there and the the the, the chopper itself would feel the concussion you'd feel it move after boom, and the whole thing would just kind of move from the concussion then we come back if it blew open uh which happened a bunch of times you know blow the top of it off and uh anybody that was wounded we'd kill them um I want to come back to the dog um, because okay. I had an interesting reaction when you mentioned the dog, and it sounds like it, it was similar to yours. Um, and I'm not sure I've ever brought this up before with a combat veteran. Probably, I don't remember. When you said that the pilot said, shoot the dog, my response was, don't shoot the dog. But had the story been, and then a, a VC jumped up and ran, and then I shot him. I just would have sat here and listened. I had a reaction when I thought about the possibility of you shooting the dog. And it sounds like as gung-ho as you were, why would I want to shoot the dog? So what is that? What is that? How do you interpret that in your own mind? This this reaction that both of us had that yeah. no, don't you know the dog was so innocent, you know. That's it. The thing, yeah, the animal was innocent. That's what it was. Even though I had already shot water buffaloes, uh, huge, they would have, somebody would be farming ducks, all right? So there might be maybe, I would guess maybe three, 400 ducks in a big area. And I'd shoot 79 rounds down there and blow up a whole bunch of ducks. I had a couple water buffaloes with 79 rounds. Um, birds that were flying, we shot at them. Um, I didn't care about them, but there was this dog. I think that whole connection might be that, you know, mm -hmm. we love dogs. Dogs are our friends. You know, man's best friend is a dog. And that kind of whole yeah. element, I'm sure, yeah. came into play. And in the other cases, the water buffalo, the ducks, those were clearly VC resources. Yeah. Is that the idea there? Yeah, it was just something to do fun, laugh. You know, we, oh. we laughed at stuff that we did like that. I mean, that was kind of like we would, uh, you know, I hit a water buffalo and we when we'd sit down, we'd laugh. Go, man, did you see that water buffalo is running across ground? My whole side of it opened up and hit the ground, and it's like, yeah, wow. That was that was the uh, order of the day. You know, we didn't. There wasn't this feeling bad about what we were doing. We were into it big time. Um, dropping incendiary grenades into into hooches, burning them. Um, you know, we just get over the top, pop an incendiary grenade, it burned through an engine block. I, I don't recall, but I'm pretty sure that it, it the, the, the idea that we would hear, would hear that it could burn right through an engine block, which I'm sure it could. White phosphorus grenades, uh, concussion grenades. 
want to go back to what you said um, a minute ago. So we would, if VC were wounded, and I'm assuming you're dealing overwhelmingly with VC, not too much NVA, all the way yeah. down that tail yeah. end. Of the, um, yeah. So VC wounded, and then we would kill them. So now, uh, so I'm interested in this. So, I mean, was this um, a policy that, you know, we could call medevacs to come get them, but we're not going to, or was it just understood in this context? That was all up to me. That wasn't up to anybody. Nobody called that shot. That was what I wanted to do. I had to call on that. When the bunker blew open and they're there and I'm seeing a move, I'm just going to shoot and kill them. That, that, you know, I got then and then reporting up, I got three KBAs. I mean, those were mine. Those were, there was. Help, remind me what KBA is, I'm sorry. Killed by air. Okay. Okay. So, and that's, that's what we report. Um, there, it wasn't like a competition between all of us and who killed more, but everybody respected each other. And we sort of had reputations, if you will. So you lived with your reputation. Some guys, uh, the, some guys did things one way. Some guys did things the other way. Depend it, some guys used certain weapons. Some guys didn't use those weapons. The weapons I used were different from the weapons other guys used. And, and that made a uh, significant, some, like, a, like a, rep, it, it was significant to your reputation. It was like, I used a 79. Guys thought that was pretty cool because it blew people up. So it was like, wow, you know, Vertigo blows them up 79. Some guys use 60s and, you know, they, they shot it, blew people up with those. That, that's just how it was. So when it came time when somebody was wounded, you know, well, I'm going to kill him. That's it. He's not living. He's dying. That's, that's the end of it. There was nobody to tell me I could. There was nobody to tell me I couldn't. There was a time when there was a, uh, a man inside a sandpan. A friend, I don't know if he was friendly, but bottom line was, and it didn't really matter. In some of the areas we were, if they were friendly, there were guys, not necessarily, I don't remember myself, but others that did kill friendlies, you know, that I, I thought they were friendly, but they decided they kill them. We were a wing ship. We were trying to learn how to fly a lead. There were two walking down the road. They were holding hands, which was, you know, their their custom. And we just went by. They seemed okay. The other ship came in and just smoked them away, said they were eligible males and killed them. That was it. Because well, it was a free fire zone or something? Would that be the rush? Yeah, yeah. And, uh, but in this area that I was, this guy was in a rice paddy. He was moving a sand pan down through the rice paddy. And he had bamboo poles in there. And they were so maybe about four or five feet long. And, you know, they, you know, the idea was they were hiding rockets and these things. And, you know, we bought into all that shit. So he's moving along and uh, we get over there and he kind of stops and he's looking at us and I'm looking at him. Everything's wide open. And I got my car, I got my weapon on him. And uh, the pilot yelled upstairs. He goes, he called up to the CNC command helicopter. He says, we got an eligible male down here. And uh, Major Kidwell, I heard him in my headphone, kill him, kill him dead. So I'm getting ready to shoot him and I put my car down and I grab my 79 because I want to hit him with a grenade. I want to blow him up. I don't want to miss him. I want to blow him up in front of everybody because everybody would go, whoa, check him out. He blew him up. You know, it would be the big talk of the day that Vertigo blew this guy up with a 79 round guy went every which way. So I'm aiming at him with my 79 and I'm getting ready to squeeze off. I'm literally right there squeezing off on him. I always remember how intense that was. And I'm getting ready to let go. And suddenly he's got his hands up in the air. He brings his hands together and he starts to pray. And I stop. I'm like, whoa, this guy's praying to God. That's what I said to myself. And I stopped and I went, whoa. And I realized within my whole self and being, I can't kill this guy. So I said to the pilot on the radio, I go, I said, I can't kill him. I said, he's praying. And I said, what? He said, kill him, Vertigo. I go, no, I said, he's praying. I said, you can kill him if you want. I said, I'm not praying. I said, I'm not killing him. He goes, okay. So he got on the radio and we had a communication between the two of us. And then there was a communication upstairs. They didn't always hear what we, we were talking about. So he called the old man upstairs said, look, you know, he says, uh, my, my Oscar doesn't want to kill him. He goes, what the fuck's going on there? He's killing you, pussy. He goes, no, he's down here praying. So Kidwell said, okay, okay. He says, well, we'll come down and pick him up. So in the meantime, the old man now wants to try to show me he's got nothing in the sand pan. 
and I'm screaming at him. I got my weapon pointed. Now I put my car, my 79 down. I got my car in my hand and I'm like screaming at him, trying to and wave on my weapon to try to tell him to get away. Cause now I'm panicking that he's going for something. I got to kill him. And I've already established he's talking to God. So I'm really kind of freaking out inside at this point. I'm real panicking this. And I'm like screaming at him, get away, get away. And the pilot, he moved the helicopter over there. And finally the, 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 the wind from the chopper blades just kind of pushed the sand pan away and he was just kind of standing there by himself and I felt a sense of relief and then the uh, CNC command chopper came down and picked him up and took him away so I, I don't know anything I'm sorry I just I don't know whether he was VC later whether they interpreted him or whether they killed him or anything just that I know that he was gone and it wasn't on me so what I'm wondering is um first if you know his his you know having his hands together like that and a, a gesture of prayer i'm wondering whether him doing that humanized him in a sense and perhaps it's not something you're conscious of and then i'm i'm a question i wanted to ask you is i think there's a photo of a i believe it's a, a catholic priest a chaplain um doing a service uh, among yeah. your photos um of Italian heritage, so my guess would be that you have some, at least a traditional connection to the Catholic Church, and I don't want to read too much into it, and it, this is not something you're, you're consciously processing. When you see that guy in a, pa in a posture of prayer, do you think all of that stuff just kind of instantly comes into your mind? I, I can relate to this. I've seen this hundreds of times before at the Catholic Church, this guy's a human. Is, do you think that, I mean, does that make sense yeah. that him doing that humanized yeah. him in your mind? Yeah. Yeah. I grew up Catholic, you know, I went to Catholic high school, grade school, you know, all of that was instilled in me. And when, when at that moment, you know, it was, it was strong prior to that, you know, I, I prayed. There were times that I was praying, but I didn't see them as, um, ironically enough on Easter, April 6th of 69, I was at Makwa and it was Easter and we decided to go to church and we went to a Vietnamese church and they had, it was the first time I really understand why, understood why we had a Latin mass. The mass was in Latin. I understood the whole thing. And uh, actually a friend of mine that was uh, not, he wasn't Catholic. He went to communion. We had him have his first communion that day. But that wow. night, ironically enough, we ended up getting hit at Makwa. But yeah, there was this, there, there at that moment with that guy there was there was that realization that it, it didn't matter he was praying to god and the god had come into play on this whole thing and said you know you're not killing him and he's not killing you this game's over you know i just it was shocking it was it was it was hard to take but i left it behind you know after that it wasn't anything that came into play for you know the next night or week after or anything like that it was that moment i was back to killing looking to kill somebody later on that after that moment you know the rest of the day it was like let's find some people and kill them you were shot down um can you relate that story yeah that was uh september 19th of 69 um we were working actually ironically enough we'd been working at a base camp out of then long we usually didn't do that we went somewhere else and that was our staging area and uh, we had been, we, we were the next team to go out. We were sitting around just putts and doing nothing, actually loaded up, just sitting around killing time. And suddenly a radio call came in. One of the other teams, the first team that went out, they got shot down. So right away, my pilot was Tom Landry, Red Dog. So Red Dog and I jumped in the chopper and took off out there and uh, um, to relieve them. So we found out where they were and we started working the area where they were. But we had gotten onto this stage, and uh, the, they, were, they were dug in pretty deep. There were a couple of different bunkers area, areas. And uh, what I recall is in this is he spotted a guy in a tree. He said, got one in the tree. And I'm looking, I couldn't see him in the tree. He had some green stuff on himself, you know. Finally, I spotted him, and I used my car, and I fired into him, and I hit him. And uh, he kind of, like, fell out of the tree down to the bottom of the rice paddy, and he was down in the water. So Red Dog decided that he wanted to fly over him with a minigun and give him another blast. So he did. I hung out on my ship and I fired with my 79 and had that with me. And I wanted to drop around on top and blow him up too. 
And just about after I'd fired, that's when I felt the sting on my right hand. And I'm like, whoa, all of a sudden, I, something stung my hand bad. And I go, I'm hit, I'm hit. And then I hear him say, we're hit, we're hit. And I thought he was telling them that I'd gotten hit. But the next thing, all I saw was the ground rushed up and boom, bam, we were tumbling every which way. And you hear the engine going and whining and rah, 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 just rolling around. And I'm like, and at this moment, I now start to pray. Dear God, please, I don't want to die. And I started thinking about my mother and my brother, my family and all of that, my grandpa, everybody, you know, and I'm like, whoa, this is, this is bad, you know, and I'll, we stopped tumbling and I could hear the engine whining and the rotor blades had already been broken off. I had no clue what was going to go on there, but uh, um, I'm searching around trying to find out how to get out, but my seatbelt's got me locked in and I eventually get that undone. And, Were you upside uh, down or sideways or? Uh, we are we are upside down, and uh, and the reason I know that and I don't remember myself being there, but when I got out, and I got a few feet away from the ship, I was looking for Red Dog, and I looked back, and there's Red Dog upside down, his face was just covered with blood, so that hit me real hard. I thought, oh my God, he's dead. Um, I passed out then, and the next thing I because I don't remember anything else, I was just laying in the water, and next thing I knew, Red Dog was picking me up. And you, my nickname was Vertigo, but also some guys called my name was Joe, but some guys called me Jimmy. And so there was Jim and that in there. So he's like, come on, Jim, let's get the hell out of here. And he kind of picked me up and the other ship started coming in. In the meantime, rounds are coming at us every which way. Wow. And uh, we climbed up into the back of the other loach. And uh, that's when we took off. And ironically, the night before that, we had had a party, uh, a scout party. And we got these scarves. Said seven of the first air cab, and had our nickname on, and we were going to fly with those around our neck just for something to be different than everybody else. Sure. We weren't allowed to wear it on base camp, but we decided that this is what was going to go on. So I had my scarf on me, and it was brand new. But Red Dog was bleeding like a sieve off the top of his forehead. He was open up, got about forty-five stitches in there. Mm -hmm. So I took my scarf and I wrapped it around his head, and trying to stop him from bleeding everywhere because it was just all over us and both, and tied him down. And uh, since we were, the good side was where we got shot down. We were only about ten minutes away from the hospital, Bentui Hospital. So they uh, Sewell he flew and he took us right over to uh, Bentui Hospital. <clears throat> they took us in there right away and that's we spent a, almost a week there we were lucky we were real lucky one of the rounds hit the transmission blew the engine right on out but we were lucky that i just got like winged and he got hit in the head but we had concussions bruises broken teeth that kind of thing i have 52 days left in vietnam mm -hmm. then 20 days later i was flying with a cw white and we went down to the human forest. And that's when I got shot down the second time. And I only had 32 days left in Vietnam at that time. But that was pretty intense down the human forest. We almost got ourselves captured, I mean, that's for sure. It was ironic. I had, after the first time, it was about a few, maybe a few days after I got back from the hospital, I started flying again. And I felt anxious. It was the first time I felt anxiety. And it was like, whoa. Come on, why are we flying so slow? So, you know, come on, speed it up. You know, I could feel this well, fear inside me. Mm -hmm. And then I flew again, and I remember feeling it again. And it didn't really go away. It was there. There was, there was, there was a fear and anxiety. Um, but at, as the day went on, I didn't have it anymore. So then it was the uh, 9th of October. However, on the 8th of October, I'd been over at the officer's hooch, and I, we, we all associated with each other. We were laughing and bullshitting at night and uh, drinking beers. And I just had this overwhelming feeling I was going to get shot down. I really did. It was like a premonition. It was like, I'm going down tomorrow. And everybody's laughing. Oh, man, Vertigo, don't talk like that. Go, no, no, no. I said, it's okay. I said, I just, I said, I know I'm going down tomorrow. Because we were talking about the human force. We were talking about how bad of an area it was. That didn't bother me. I'd already been to, the, that was something else. I'd already been to the human. So it wasn't that it scared me. I knew it was down there, but I just had this feeling I was going down, strong feeling. And we laughed all night long, bullshitted. So I ended up back to the hooch and uh, going to bed that night. And I remember talking to one of the other scouts, Lovell. 
He said, you said, what are you doing? I said, oh, I love us. I'm going down tomorrow. He says, oh, man. He says, why are you talking like this? Because that's what's happening. So on the morning when I was getting all my uh, chicken plate and my weapon and my ammo and everything together, I had flown with my camera, an Instamatic camera, a few days before. So I went to go get my camera, and I thought, and I also had a Yashica Electra 35. And I went to get the, the, the uh, Instamatic, and I thought, nah, I'm going to take the Yashica. And then I thought, I'm going to get shot down. Why am I taking this good camera with me? But I took it anyway. And I had some good pictures, but I never got my camera back. But I even, we out, got out to the flight line. I even told White that day, that morning before we took off. I says, uh, I says, I know you heard that I was talking last night that I got a feeling we'd get shot down today. He goes, yeah. Are you sure you want to go? He goes, get the fuck in a helicopter. He says, we're going. Come on. So we got in and we took off down to the human. When we got there, which was unusual, was usually we'd sit down for and take a break for a little while before we take off. It was still kind of dark. And sun was just getting ready to come up. We'd leave when it was dark. And then all of a sudden, I see them going like this. And it's like, wow, we're going. Let's go. Crank them up, buddy. Let's go. So we jumped in and, and getting ready for it. We took off. And uh, it was amazing that day because it just the things we were running into, little village along a, a, a little creek or canal or whatever it was, I started burning everything. Anything and everything. I was dropping seniorities on anything and burning. I had a burning up a whole little town and village. Um, spotted a, a, a bunker of trees coming out in a uh, bunker area. I marked that. It got blown up. I came back over and there were bodies in there and I ended up shooting all the bodies in there. We had 11 kills going that morning. I believe that White and I got, we were getting credit for them, even though I think the Cobra should have gotten a little bit of credit, but we took credit for their kills. And that's just how it was. Um, and then I burned this really, really nice hooch down. It had a porch. It had an overhang on it with poles, you know, little like a little uh, fencing in front. It was real nice. It, somebody was big that owned that puppy down there. That's for sure. I started that thing on fire. And then all of a sudden, the old man said, uh, he says, we got some smoke over here. And he says, come on this way, because they were up high and they could see further than we could. So we flew over to the area where there was some grass and there was smoke coming out of the ground and out of the grass area. And I'm looking at this and and I thought, well, the first thing I'm going to do is drop a 79 round down there, which I did right away. And then out of my right eye, I caught it. There was a flash. And all of a sudden, we started shaking. I'm like, whoa, we got hit. And uh, then there was another impact. And I remember that, uh, crazy as it was, well, it made more sense. And my thought was, I, did, I, I don't want to shoot back, and maybe they'll stop shooting at us. Because we were such, I knew we were so vulnerable. It's like we're up in the air we're shaking something's going bad and i'm like thinking maybe if i don't shoot at him and then all of a sudden we kind of nosed in and started to do a little spiral of going down because we weren't down low at the time we were kind of high and uh i remember then praying again to god saying god i don't know if i can ask you twice but please get me out of this I, somehow you know, we'll break even i didn't say somehow we're, we're breaking i just somehow please get me out of this i don't want to die and uh i remember crashing and we were trapped underwater and i again i was I, I was having trouble holding my my breath and stuff and uh um then i i said dear god please help me and my hand went to my safety belt release and it released and i come up and i was like spitting out water i had taken a side a hit to my chest protector my armored chest protector so it had, i was like having a problem breathing anyway because this had just hit me in the chest but it didn't I lucky it didn't hit me direct. It must hit me on an angle because it broke it. But it was like I could feel the pain in my chest. And I was trying to get out. I could feel white trying to get out of there. We both kind of got white got out. Then I kind of climbed out. Rounds were going, all I could hear was shh, 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 shh. You can hear ping, ping, ching, ping, ching, ping, every which way. And uh, um, then I looked up and there was the other ship came in close. A guy named Lindbergh, Frank Lindbergh, he got out of the ship. And he came over and he helped me with white and he pulled white, got white into the ship. And then I kind of he helped me into the ship. And I'm like, come on, everything go ping, ping, ping. And Lindbergh's still standing there making sure we're in the ship, big balls. And then he got in and we started to take off. But as we started to take off, this time we had a little bit too much weight. We weren't getting out of there. We were low level because of our weight. 
And uh, meantime, they were shooting at us from every which way. We were all okay, they were huge. And I could see them. I could see them right the, into the tree line. And they were doing bang, bang, bang like oh. this with a whole patch. And I'm watching him and he's looking at me and I'm like, you know, looking our way. And I know eyeball to eyeball, but yeah. And then eventually the chopper started to lift up. And then that's when I felt the sense of relief that, you know, we're going to get out of here. And then we got back to a staging area where we were. And I pretty much went pretty, I vaguely remember it, but I remember just screaming at everybody, not wanting anybody to go back there. There were just too many of them and screaming at the, uh, they had Arvins that were there and screaming at them. And I grabbed somebody 16 and I pointed it at the Arvins and I wanted them to get a piece of piece. It was P PCP. No, not PCP, PSP. It was a piece of steel that they would corrugated steel that they could make runways with. And I was yelling at them to pick it up. I wanted them to get white on a stretcher. And there was a hospital right there. So I don't remember what happened because I was really getting phasey. I just barely remembered that. But they took us right there to this little hospital right there. Uh, and uh, there were it was more like a Vietnamese something or another, but there was an American doctor there. And he got white on an IV. And uh, I remember looking over at white. There were flies all over his kneecap. Bone was sticking out. And. And uh, I wanted to, I kept screaming at the doctor to get him out of pain. I want to kill, I'll kill you, I'll kill you. And the Vietnamese were looking in the, there were no glass windows, they were just open. So they were all looking at us. And I was, I was pretty much just screaming. I remember just screaming at everybody. And uh, I'm pretty sure the doctor was about fed up with that kind of behavior, me telling him I wanted to kill him. And uh, because he had had an IV in me, and then he put something in the, I, you know, boom, I was whacked. I was out. Mm -hmm. So they they took us to Bentui Hospital, and uh, that's where we went. And, uh, and and White made it. Yeah, White did, and I had shrap metal up. I had, eventually got another nickname. It was called Shrap Metal Ass because I caught shrap metal up and down my ass. You know, <laughs> when it was blowing up everywhere. Uh, yeah, and White, but White was. We were both in a hospital, and about three days later, they took White. He went to Japan, and that pretty much freaked me out. When White was gone, I think it was the next night I had, I, at the time, didn't know what it was. Today, I understand exactly what it was. I had a massive panic attack. Uh, I just, I was, it was late at night. I started to really get massive anxiety and panickiness. I literally, because of the medications, I literally was hallucinating. I started seeing the word death. I started seeing uh, dead Viet Cong, skeletons, and I'm like, really freaking out over this you know i'm screaming i yelling for the doctors and the nurse come over what's the matter so i'm dying i'm dying they're like what 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 they got blood pressure on me and they they don't know what's going on and i'm you know i i feel like i'm dying i don't think they gave me anything but they might have i remember in the morning when i woke up though it was i wasn't really materializing everything around me i was there but things just didn't feel materialize it couldn't con concrete there was nothing there i was detached from things and i knew i knew i was mentally in trouble at that point and uh when i talked to the doctor came around i go i gotta see somebody if something's wrong with me so they eventually a, a day or two later sent me up they you know they put you on uh, these big transport planes and flew me up to long Bend, and i went to a hospital third surge up there they put me in a psychiatric ward up there